maybe you? Yeah. <laughs> Are we on schedule? <laughs> the Turks are on top of it. Yes, there will be no delays. Please, Mr. President. I am asking you to reconsider. No, begging. The Sector 7 Undercity is home to more than 50,000... <sighs> Director Twisty. At least let us issue a warning, sir. The stench of the director's cowardice fills the room yet again. <clears throat> Breathe. Progress requires sacrifice. Learn to live with it. Damn it, Reeks. to get to Sector 7. Yeah. Alright, so we're fighting Abzu now. I'm pretty sure this wasn't the name of this monster in the original game. Now the character, the, the creature design is very much inspired by the creature that we saw in the original game. I'm pretty sure its name was like Aps or Graps or something with two P's in it. Abzu, I'm pretty sure, is like a, uh, it's like a Sumerian god of the ocean or something like that. I guess this thing lives in water, so... Hmm. I mean, God of the Sewers? I doubt that's what it was. Although, these sort of references to ancient mythological deities are a pretty common thing in this kind of game. So I guess they were gonna use a name like that. Although, uh, uh, maybe it was a mistranslation. Why it was named something different in the original, at least American version, or English version, of Final Fantasy VII. This scene does sort of play out a little bit like the original one did. Of course, like with the lower detail and the turn-based battle system, you just sort of got dropped through the floor like you did in the last episode. And I think, I think you did have the option of checking on the two girls, which one you were going to check on first, either Tifa or Ares. And I guess that had something to do with like the dating minigame that happened later on, which one you checked on first got more affection points. Although I'm not sure about that. It's possible that it was just sort of a cutscene that played out. 
although it, it's not quite like a cutscene in the way we think about it in the modern context. It was just sort of a dialogue scene. You would check on one of the two girls, and then the battle would start, and then you had a creature that sort of looked like this. You'd fight. And it wasn't a particularly difficult fight. Now, I don't even think the first time I played through the game as a kid I even had any trouble with it. The fights in this version of Final Fantasy VII take quite a bit longer. I feel like this is a fight that we should have been able to get through quick, but it takes a good, what, uh, seven minutes or so? But anyway... Don Corneo, I think maybe I'd maybe mentioned this or came up with this in an earlier episode. It's been a little while since I recorded the, the gameplay for this. I've since gone and finished the game, and now I'm just sort of catching up on my commentary, rec uh, recording the commentary for it. Corneo in this game is portrayed very differently than he was in the original. No, he's still a pervy bastard. And that certainly didn't change. But the way he was portrayed in the original version of the game, his original rendition, was much less of a person you could take seriously. He came across as just some rich, uh, rich fat bastard who just wanted to have sex with women who were way out of his league. And his character model, his character design was so goofy because he was... With the low-poly low poly and low-texture character models they had at the time, he had this really exaggerated, oversized look to him, where he was shaped kind of like an egg, and when he's, like, dry-humping the air, it just looks really stupid, and I guess was intended to be funny. Of course, you can't get away with doing that nowadays with the modern character designs and all that kind of stuff. Just sort of like, um, like how... The character design of Tifa and the character design of Barrett had to change with the concept of higher detail character models. It changes the way a person would perceive a character. Now, if they wrote Corneo exactly the same way, it, would, it wouldn't come across the same way. He wouldn't come across as funny anymore because he's got that more realistic looking uh, body shape to him. And you have him acting the same way. It would be a lot creepier and less funny than the original version was. So then you go and you have a different looking character model and he can't really be funny like he used to, so what other option did they have then to make you just kind of have to take him more seriously as a threat? Corneo, I guess, was always supposed to have ties to Shinra and he was always supposed to be rich and he was always supposed to be some kind of a mobster or a gangster. But he himself wasn't any kind of like a real threat. It was just more of who he associated with. And the fact that he had a lot of people working for him, which were dangerous. In this, he seems a little bit more like a... Like, oh, maybe we shouldn't actually mess with this guy. In fact, even uh, Aerith goes and makes a mention that... Like, it doesn't matter how good of a fighter she is, referring to Tifa. That it doesn't matter because Corneo is a dangerous person. And when Cloud thinks about just kicking down the door and causing trouble, that uh, Leslie guy was like, like, no, 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 it's going to cause more trouble, just don't do it. So yeah, you got... Ah, oh, he got away. <laughs> Corneo is taken more seriously in this. This boss battle, like a number of the boss battles in this game, it's sort of, there is a certain strategy to it. Now, you do have to dodge attacks and all that, like in most fights, but you have the two horns on the head, and you've seen this a few times, where you damage a specific part of the body, and then once you manage to destroy that part of the body, it sort of staggers the boss itself. And when it's staggered, you can do more damage to it. Now, once I broke one of the horns, that's when uh, it fell over, and I caused the majority of the damage I've managed to in this, I've managed to in this uh, fight so far. And it keeps jumping out of the way and tackling your characters down. <laughs> yeah, good job, Cloud. You missed completely. We'll see it more in the next couple of episodes, but there is this, like, a little bit of redesign with the idea of the way Midgar is set up. 
to make it feel more like it wasn't a recent city. More like it's a much older place, or Shinra building the plate was a more recent addition to a much older city that existed well before then. But I'll get into that when we start seeing it, you know? Probably Corneo's pet. And we were dinner. <laughs> hey, you don't believe that crazy story of his, do you? Shinra wouldn't sacrifice a whole sector just to take out Avalanche, would they? Destroying part of the city, killing all those people just to get at us? I don't know. Is Corneo the kind of guy who'd make up shit just to screw with you? I wouldn't put it past him. But, if he was telling the truth... Hmm? And there's still a chance he was, isn't there? Then, we should go. And if it turns out he was lying, then so what? Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tifa! I knew it. These tunnels are all connected. What is it? I'm pretty sure we can use these tunnels to make our way back to Sector 7. The sewers under Sector 6 and 7 should be connected. If you get in trouble, just follow the stench. Another one of those lessons? An avalanche saying, actually. We use them to move around the Undercity, in emergencies. Sure we're not lost? Positive. There should be a big waterway just up ahead. Let's find that first. Lead the way. All right, we got a whole tunnel to navigate our way around in down here and haul new enemies and all that kind of stuff. But there's something I actually want to do before we move on. Realizing that, well, you were going to have a bit of a different cutscene depending on which girl you decided to check on, I went back and I, well, recorded the other version. What happens if you check on Tifa instead of Aerith? And, well, let's go watch that. Tifa? Uh, Cloud. We have to get back to the slums right now. Yeah. I didn't want to drag Aerith into all this. She'll understand. How do you two know each other? I saved her. She saved me. Round and round it goes. And... That's all there is to it. Sure there isn't something else going on? Mm. Uh, uh, uh. Damn it. Alright, so I get what was supposed to be happening there. You, for the sake of Cloud, are making the decision on which character you care about more, so you check on whichever one first. The other character has to wake up and realize that she wasn't Cloud's the first one that Cloud paid attention to. And, well, both of them seem to just sort of brush it off and move on with their day, because we got more important shit to worry about, but that's supposed to stick in their mind and all that. But what doesn't make sense to me is the way that the cutscene actually played out. That Cloud got drawn into a rather long conversation with Tifa there, or Aerith in the other version of the cutscene. And, like, as soon as he realized, <laughs> I mean, it, it only makes sense, that as soon as he realized that she was okay, then he'd go and check on the other one. Nope, he's standing there talking to Tifa, who's still on the ground for some damn reason. And then Aerith is over there, all unconscious on the floor of a fucking sewer. It just doesn't... <laughs> it looks strange to me. It didn't play out naturally. We have to get there in time to stop it. We have to. 
Right. Mm. Aerith, what are you not telling me? 